fifteen p.m. And I'm calling this meeting to order. Um, this is a budget oversight hearing on the Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services, also known as DYRS, for the FY23 proposed operating budget for the agency. Proposed operating budget for DYRS is $89,829,083 which is an approximate 4.9% increase over the FY22 budget. The proposed FY23 capital budget is $4,322,852, which is a 275% increase of the FY22 budget. I don't see any other members ready. As I call on the first panel witnesses, they be promoted as the audience, to the audience from being the panelists. All public witnesses appearing on, on their behalf will be allowed uh, three minutes to testify. Um, public witnesses of a bona fide organization will be allowed five minutes, including the value neighborhood commissioners. Um, we will start with some of our public witnesses. And we do note that there are youth who um, may be called, may not be seen, and may name may not be used, but probably in the most valuable voice we can hear today. So we're gonna start off by using um, some acronyms. So I'll start off with RH, TB, SP. Hello, Council Member Trade. I have RH with me now. All right, let's start right here. Hello, my name is Romel. I'm a DRS post committee youth. I'm currently enrolled in high school at my Angelo Academy, and I'm in 12th grade. The programs I enjoyed the most being at DRS was being involved in a restorative justice training, a barber program, dramatic arts, and Me We DC. That's a program to show, tell the world about your story and don't let no one else tell it for you. These programs were important to me because, in my opinion, it helped me better my life skills. And it helped me better my life skills and find out who I really was. URS has helped me to figure myself out and learn about what I really want to do in my life and the achievements that I wanted to overcome. I would like to thank Dr. Kearns for being very supportive since the first day I met her. And also I would like to thank Dante Smith for never giving up on me. Thank you. Uh, we'll come back to you in a minute. TB or SP? I don't think um, SP has long gone as of yes. And what was the other initial you had? I don't think they're on as well. I'm sorry, I can't hear you, you're muted. Thank you. I said, that's fine. I'll just jump back to RH real quick. Um, RH, you talked about uh, those who have been significant in helping you stay on the right track. First, get on the right track and stay on the right track. Uh, through which programs did these individuals serve in and uh, what kept you interested in the programs? Um, the program that most stood out to me was the restorative justice training. In the restorative justice training, I was a facilitator, and not only because I'm a great communicator, I'm a leader, so it's, I have a big influence on my peers, and I, it's easy for me to convey a message to them. Are you, uh, are you um, still in DYS custody now? No, I'm post committed. Okay. So what are you doing with yourself these days? Um, right now, I'm just finishing my last two and a half months of high school. Okay, that's excellent. Excellent. Did, have you, uh, where are you with, your, what's the next? What's your plans for your next step? To be honest, my next 
that is, I want to go to college and major in computer science so I can become an IT. That's excellent. Uh, I've been, I just did a Zoom a couple of months ago uh, with a program here in DC called the Hope Project. And we had two gentlemen on there who um, had, you know, trouble backgrounds. And uh, it was a, probably about five or six total. But I was really impressed because both ended up becoming homeowners through the careers in IT and never had any IT experience. And I get one of the, they are adults. And so one of the things they thought was that because they need clearances to get into IT that they probably would not be able to get a job, but they are making, both make over $100,000 a year within two years, I'm sorry, two to three years of being in IT. So um, I say pursue that, man. That's, that's, a, real, that's a real powerful thing. Yes. Um, also, probably right here, I want also thank my credible messenger, Wade Lewis, because without him, I don't think I would be yeah, I, don't, I don't think I would be here where I am right now. Um, he pushed me, even when I was detained, he always pushed me to tell me that I could have been better, and he know I got better in me. Uh, like this morning, he called my phone 20 times telling me to get ready. Yeah. So he got me up this morning. I like to thank for that. That's powerful, man. So you know um, that you have an obligation. Go, They go back once you are super successful to do that for someone else, man. That's, that's the whole concept and principle, you know? B building bridges, man. Um, any last comments? Yeah, anything else you want to say? No, no, no. Okay. Just go ahead and tell them. That's it. Oh, that's, that's it, Mr. White. Well, thank you. I appreciate you coming this morning and we look forward to figure out how we can support you and our other youth who are inspired to do great things like you. Stay focused, man, and go, go for it all, man. Yes. All right. Be blessed. Um, Council member um, White, we do have SP that is joining us, but I'm not sure when he will join us. He's, he just got the link, so I'm not sure if he'll be clicking on. All right. You can just put it in the comment once you do get on. And we'll okay. add to, the, to one of the panels. Thank you. Yep. All right. Can we get, um, Alexandra Fields, Evans. Hello, Council Member Trayon White. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Hold on one second. Let me elevate okay. Paris Marcia, um, DC Bridges Program Coordinator. Mustafa, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mustafa Plummer, and Remy Henderson, Dolls and Dreams. And T. Era Walker, we might as well elevate everyone at the same time. And if uh, SP is ready, uh, we can bring him or her in as well. All right, we're going to start right at way with you, Ms. Fields. Thank you. And good afternoon, Chairman White, members of the Committee on the Recreation Libraries and Youth Affairs. My name is Alexandra Fields Evans, and I am the Senior Manager at CASA for Children of DC. We are absolutely honored to have the opportunity to testify with you today. CASA DC recognizes the vital importance of rehabilitation services for our youth in the juvenile justice system and particularly opportunities for restorative justice and transition support. For 20 years, CASA DC has provided compassionate trauma-informed care for court-involved youth in DC. CASA stands for Court-Appointed Special Advocates and they're specially trained volunteers who provide mentorship 
and best interest advocacy to court involved youth. Through Casa DC's original mission, when founded in 2002, focused on supporting foster youth in our years of service to DC youth, the intersection of needs between foster youth and juvenile justice involved youth became painfully clear. The foster care to prison pipeline is a reality that too many youth face. Youth who have experienced abuse and neglect are more likely to be arrested as a juvenile, offended, offend more frequently and begin at younger ages than peers. Approximately 80% of juvenile justice youth have experienced trauma similar to their counterparts in the child welfare system. Understanding the impact of childhood trauma on juvenile justice involved youth is imperative to providing youth with appropriate support and preventing recidivism. Youth who have experienced trauma face lower academic achievement and increased risk for future unemployment, homelessness, and high risk behavior. CASA DC applauds the Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services for providing committed youth with case management and wraparound services. However, there is more that can be done. CASA DC hopes that through future partnership, the CASA model can provide additional benefit to youth committed to DYRS. CASA DC's Bridges program was formed in 2019, and since that time has supported more than 70 justice involved youth with demonstrated success. Volunteers in the Bridges program called juvenile, Bridges Juvenile Advocates provide mentorship and best interest advocacy to justice involved youth. Though young, it has promising results, including recidivism of 23.3%, significantly less than DYRS recidivism rate of 31%. Youth committed to DYRS can significantly benefit from the support of a volunteer BGA or Bridges Juvenile Advocate. The presence and involvement of a caring and supportive adult is a known protective factor against juvenile justice for youth. Bridges Juvenile Advocates make a true difference in the lives of their youth. Over 8% of Bridges youth have substantially engaged their BG thanks to a personalized relationship formed and working with only one youth at a time. And with this support, 80% of our justice impacted youth demonstrate pro-social behaviors, three quarters demonstrate positive communication skills, 86% can identify and practice positive coping skills, 73% of youth has set proactive goals with their volunteers, and 90% of our justice impacted youth feel optimistic about their future. As community-based volunteers, BGAs can offer a separation from those connected to DYRS services, providing an additional person who the youth can view as a trusted adult. CASA DC was recently awarded a contract with court social services to provide mentoring services to justice involved youth and is pending a unit assignment. We would be eager to extend our mentoring services to DYRS involved youth or to establish a formalized referral process for DYRS youth to receive the support of a volunteer Bridges Juvenile Advocate at no additional cost to the agency. CASA DC can support DYRS now more than ever. A portion of CFSA's mentoring funding has been re reallocated to DYRS for mentoring services, currently provided through the credible- I yeah, you wrap it up? You got your oh, five minutes. Absolutely. So right. in conclusion, CASA DC can be an additional support for DYRS youth improving their outcomes for their future. Thank you, Chairman White, members of the committee, youth um, and the Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services for all you do. Thank you. Um, Ms. Paris Marcia. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Chairman White and members of the Committee on Recreation, Libraries, and Youth Affairs. My name is Paris Mercier, the Bridges Program Coordinator at CASA for Children of DC. 
It is a privilege to have the opportunity to share a piece of my story with all of you today. I present my story to you all as a first generation college graduate holding a double bachelor's degree, alive, healthy, fully independent and without any noticeable receipt of what my past looks like. Growing up, my life looked nothing like how, I'm, how I am presenting it to you today. I grew up extremely impoverished in one of the poorest cities in California. I come from a family of women. We were small, but so mighty. My mom, my older sister, and my twin and I, just four of us. That's how I like to remember it anyways. I first entered the foster care system at the age of six after suffering extensive sexual abuse from my stepfather in our home. There are large parts of my story and why things were the way they ended up that our mom protected us from. So there are pieces I'll never be able to puzzle together. She was always protecting us. I spent two years in the system during my first go around. Most of that time has been trauma blocked from my memory, but I have fond memories of social workers and visitations with my mom and two sisters that I hold on to. Fast forward to being freshly 12 years old and my sisters and I had just lost our mom to cancer. There we were right back into the system. This time there wasn't anyone else doing the shielding and protecting. It felt like the world had crumbled down to just the air and land around my feet. I started spending my life in survival mode. At 12 years old, I carried the responsibility and burden of an adult. Grades began to slip. I began to fight in school, ran away often, and was consistently on the hunt for a home. No matter where I was placed or who I was placed with, nothing felt like home anymore. I wanted the same feeling I had with my mother. No matter how many times someone told me I was like one of their own, I could feel the difference, the treatment, the lack of consideration, the always coming last and being the afterthought. The realities of being a child in foster care after a tragedy of any kind isn't easy. Hi, my name is, and I'm here to help and be here for you. I remember the first time I was assigned to CASA and had to meet with her. This was after my sisters and I had just been failed by our assigned social worker as we sat in a house with padlocked cabinets and bike locked refrigerator doors in a foster home. We were all in before we would be split in, into different cities and never live with one another again. After the age of 13, please don't take that as blame or as a shagged finger. Perhaps the social worker didn't know how to address it. Whatever the case is, I hold no ill will but it did cloud my interaction with my CASA when she was assigned. I worried about how much she would miss or look past. I felt like I was screaming and no one around me could hear me, but they could only see that my lips were moving. I struggled with my behavior inside and outside of my home for many years. Everyone berated me and said things like, she is just looking for attention, but she can look for attention in more positive ways. But no one noticed me unless I was in trouble. I spent nights crying and wondering if anyone would care if I disappeared. At 13, I was questioning my existence and the value that my life added to the adults around me. No matter what I did or how I said what I needed, it was never enough until I got a CASA. Missy changed my world. She saw me without me screaming and listened to what I was saying, even if the words coming out of my mouth were different from what my needs were. She understood that, I was, that what I was saying was different from what I was saying. She saw past my behavior and how others saw me. She was the first person that spoke positively about me, even when I was inconsistent. She pulled me up and forward when everyone else had expected me to crawl my own way out at 13. She saw me. So here I am now telling my story on the other side of what feels like 10 lifetimes ago. I have a privilege to not all of us that go into the system come out with. I have the privilege of not only surviving, but thriving and using my experience to advocate for others to be pulled out of their pits, no matter what that looks like. Youth deserve the opportunity to have someone who will stand in the fire with them, whether it is to carry them, run with them, rock with them, whatever that youth needs, every child deserves it. No matter the charge, the history, or current situation, each child deserves the benefit of having someone to help hold them accountable on the days they see no value in continuing. If my CASA had held a crystal ball in front of my face at 14 and showed me where I would be now, I would have never imagined that my life would look like what it does. One of my greatest joys in this job is that I get to be a part of an organization. I don't just get, I just don't stand before you all saying what I have seen that has worked. I have lived the benefits and experience of CASA. Here at CASA DC, the Bridges program is the fire blanket in the middle of the fire. Fire blanket directions are as follows. To be used most effectively, it must cover the area needing protection and the blanket smothers out the flames and prevents the fire from spreading. 
The youth who are referred to the Bridges program get to be placed under a fire blanket. Our CASAs are the fire blanket. While I can't stand in front of you and tell you that at the end of their journey with ACASA, the youth issues that they came in with will all be solved, but I can tell you that we stop the flames from spreading and help put out the current fire that is burning. Youth in the juvenile justice system deserve someone who will help not only address the burning and effective areas, but help prevent the further harm that will and can be done. CASAs are more than an extra party on the document. CASAs are a new opportunity. CASAs are a second chance. CASAs are friends. CASAs are lifetime connections. CASAs are a light in the dark. So as I close, I can only hope that sharing this piece of my story has helped you understand and see that CASA isn't just to help address the now. It's to change what is to come. So I will leave you all with this. People will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. But people will never forget how you made them feel. Maya Angelou. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll go to our next witness, which is Mr. Mustafa Plummer, Crowd of Messengers. Good morning, everybody. I'm here on behalf of um, ERCPCP in partnership with DYRS. Our mission is multidimensional partnership, which we use to develop the youth and families in our community, and we offer a range of services to the community. We offer GED tutoring. We offer mental health services, restorative justice. We offer food distribution. We offer job opportunities, resume buildings, flag a program, college. What we do is we go into this community. We talk to the youth that's just as involved. This translates over to the families as well. And this is very important. You know, uh, we offer um, religious services, uh, which helps reach the youth and the families in the spiritual aspect. And we do this um, inside the facilities, which is Youth Service Center and New Beginnings uh, on Friday and Sundays. Some credible messages do it and the clergy come in and um, help heal the youth. Uh, and so once they come out these uh, controlled facilities, secure facilities, you know, we're able to reach them more. Um, the most, the program that most, I think is effective um, with our program is the Your Program, uh, which is youth who need additional mentoring. And they're able to come in here into a circle, uh, sort of a restorative justice circle, and you know, uh, speak about some of the things that troubled them in their daily lives. Um, I think that the GED program, which is by Georgetown, who comes in, uh, you have Dolls and Dreams, you have Bob Rent, you have a studio, all these are uh, uh, integral part in the healing of our community, give them an outlet for, um, you know, some of their mental anguish or their anger that they got inside them. Um, these programs are opportunity for our community to come together and form as one, and it's very essential. DYRS has helped to, along with the partnership of the six providers, has helped to give the community emotional, physical, and spiritual support, job placement, school enrollment. Um, and this is this is essential with our community um, with the black and brown people. Uh, I would like to thank the DORS management. I would like to thank all the CMI providers, which is the Incredible Measure Initiative, care coordination. I would like to thank the New Beginnings staff and the YSC staff. Um, and personally, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Norman Brown, Charles Dodds, Musa Mokdi, um, Wally Johnson, Kim Jackson, Ms. Moody. Um, Gunther, who's over top, over top of the school. Um, my personal PC, uh, who's Katrina Davis. You have Anthony Petty, you have James Carpenter, and many other people who help um, David Battle, who helped move this credible messenger initiative ahead. Um, without these, um, I think that um, we will have more problems in the community, but it's coming together and uh, we must not give up um, uh, faith in this system and keep it moving. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we'll hear from Tiro, I'm sorry, Remy Henderson, Dolls and Dreams. Thank you. Good morning, Council Member Treyon White. My name is Remy Henderson Smith. I am the Executive Director of Dolls and Dreams, Inc. As of 2019, in partnership with DYRS, Dolls and Dreams, Inc. has provided life skills and gender specific empowerment curriculum. Daughters Overcoming Life Lessons is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that teaches young girls and women 
whose life experiences have prevented them from unlocking their potential, the life skills that they need to succeed. Dolls and Dreams Inc. mission is to create an innovative platform that educates and empower girls and young women to galvanize their voice and to become change makers in their community. Dolls and Dreams Inc. is the heart that fuels these blossoming young women to find beauty in their life experiences so that they are more capable to create and ignite their dreams. To accomplish this, youth participants engage in weekly group sessions, one-on-one -on -one peer support, and workshop activities that focus on personal character development, entrepreneurship, cultivating confidence, mindfulness, etiquette, decision-making, and social justice and racial equity. Our program is STEAM-based, and each month, the youth engage in weekly group sessions and gain hands-on experiences, developing key transferable competencies and skill. Example, for the month of March, we celebrated Women's History Month, and our theme was the art of a woman. Youth had the opportunity to meet female entrepreneurs in the beauty industry. Youth learned how to apply makeup for the purposes of job interviews and to properly groom their hair. Youth also engaged in mindfulness workshops, learning to, learning to embrace their femininity and to embrace self-love. They also had the opportunity to learn about various flowers and the symbolic meaning while creating their own flower bouquets. It is important to understand the youth needs and encourage them to persevere. Dolls and Dreams Inc. program has impacted so many youth, ways from personal and professional development, deepening self-awareness, cultivating confidence, teaching them to galvanize their voice, increase social and emotional development, and strengthening academic performance, also transitioning into adulthood. Dolls and Dreams has maintained a healthy relationship with all of the youth who were committed and post-committed since October 2019. DYRS Achievement Center staff also play a vital role in creating a safe space and sense of belonging for not only the youth, but for the DYRS providers as well, providing innovative programming, life skills, family engagement workshops, and also ensuring that the youth receive a hot meal. DYRS has demonstrated long-term public safety by modeling positive youth justice, enriching the lives of the youth. I've witnessed many accomplishments and milestones that are broad from youth gaining academic and work experience through the workforce development, academic enrichment program, vocational training, developing CEO mindsets, and pursuing entrepreneur, embracing cultural adverse diversity, and also through art and music and other various programs. On behalf of Dolls and Dreams, Inc., I would like to thank the Department of Youth Rehabilitation Service for allowing Dolls and Dreams, Inc. the opportunity to serve the youth and the community and to help youth develop to their fullest potential. Thank you, Director Karens, for granting the Achievement Center programs the opportunity to service community and the youth as a preventive measure towards public safety. Thank you to the amazing DYRF staff, Ms. Williams, Ms. Johnson, Ms. Natalie, Mr. Frazier, Mr. Monroe, Ms. Fields, and Mr. Matt for exemplifying true leadership and excellence and the continued support and collaborating opportunities. I would like to thank the City Council for allocating funds for the Promise Ride Government Partnership. This partnership has helped transport youth safely to and from the Achievement Center, which has also increased the overall youth engagement. Thank you to all of the service providers, Credible Messengers, and the Dolls and Dreams Inc. team at DYRS who have contributed and poured into each youth. Remember, it takes a village. Here at Dolls and Dreams, we believe in every sparkle there is hope. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will now hear from Ms. Tierra Walker. All right, hello everyone. Um, my name is TR Truth, and I say that because it holds uh, power. Um, Walker, I am here as the executive director of UC Youth and Family uh, Services, um, but I'm also here as a product of DC, and I'm also here. I'm going to take this opportunity to be a youth advocate uh, and to speak on their behalf. Um, I have been a part of DYRS um, since 2015 from a community 
faith-based part. Um, when I became a vendor with them, one of the programs I want to speak on was a Saturday program. This Saturday program, these youth, we know how they are. They will go out, live their life on Friday. But every morning, every Saturday morning, these youth got up with their kids and they will come down to the Achievement Center. Um, during this time, yes, they, they had their situation of whatever was going on with life, but they were committed. One, it would look like they were just coming for the food, maybe. But we know that if they're hungry and their children are hungry, this is an opportunity for them to get food. But two, we started to notice a lot of changes in the behaviors, more specifically with their communication. With UC, that's one of the things that I really want to bring to the table. Being a youth and a part of the DC, I realized I had no one to talk to. Now I'm a spoken word artist, a motivational speaker, and I bring that energy to the youth. And with that happening, I'm exposing myself, which means I am making a raw and authentic interaction and engagement and connection with these youth. The progress that I have seen over the years, because I still encounter these youth, um, I still go to retreats. I do tra trauma-informed groups. Um, we talk about rebuilding self-esteem. Uh, DYR DYRS has offered so many opportunities for the vendors to be able to come together, um, be it on a Saturday or a weekday, so that we can provide not just services, but what I realized from the youth, it's an opportunity for them to have an outlet, to be, to be able to make this connection. As the young lady said, it is about the community support, and we do have to do this uh, as a unit and in support. Um, and DYRS offering these opportunities for us to come together, it gives that support that the youth needs. Because if they're coming from a trauma place, then inconsistencies and letdowns and the lies, those are all things that they're familiar with. So it is important that, you know, we continue to offer the opportunity and to work with DYRS and to have the city to support it because we see the, the, the challenges that we are affected with without it. Um, I will have to say this, the thank you part Thank you to everyone who does this work from their heart without an a, a issue. And yes, it comes down to money, but I'm here because I do this outside of money. So I hope that everybody realized that, I guess the numbers go up, but sometimes, again, these children are hungry. They need certain things. And when they come out of DYRS and they become post-committed, they still need clothes, right? And so these services that we offer, it gives them that hope. It gives them the opportunity. It gives them the support. Um, and then it's also just a reminder that, no matter how old you are, no matter where you come from, if we continue to work together, it will happen. So I definitely want to say thank you to all the programmers that have spoke on here. Um, thank you to, to, I'm just, it's a humbling experience, right? Thank you to everybody for this work, DYRS, 450 Achievement Center, New Beginnings. Like I've had an opportunity to work with all of these organizations and this work is not easy, but if, coming from the youth, they need us. And I know that we have to put a dollar value on it because it's politics, but from the human side, we can't put a dollar amount on it. And what we need for this city is what we need. My name is TR Truth Walker, spoken word artist, advocate for the youth. Thank you for this opportunity. Peace and blessings. Thank you. Um, thank you. I wanna jump back up to Ms. Evans from CASA. Um, for the public, can you tell us what the what the acronym of Costa means? Court appointed special advocate. Thank you. I see. I see you all have been ex in existence since two thousand and two, facing twenty years this year. Um, how long have you all had a partnership with DC and DYRS? Well, currently we serve. Um, conjointly with DYRS youth, but we don't have an official partnership. So. Um, as our juvenile justice programming has expanded and had some great outcomes, that's what we're looking forward to. Um, we have a wealth of resources and volunteers who are ready to hit the ground running to support those youth, even if they are committed. Um, what does that uh, partnership look like in your eyes? Supporting the youth around a few areas, but mainly academic achievement. Um, and so, you know, because we have the one-on-one -on -one model, we can assist with homework. We can assist in attending those IEP meetings, all of which is still relevant if a kid is committed. And after a youth um, returns to the community, we can assist in that transition, making sure that they have their resources. So in a nutshell, our four key areas are well-being, education, life skills. Thank you. Um, I, I hear all the time about the school to prison pipeline. 
Um, but I just heard a new term, the foster care to prison pipeline. Can you elaborate on what that is and what are we, what can we collectively do to stop it? Absolutely. So the foster care to prison life, life pipeline really boils down to trauma. Foster care children have a high ACE score and a lot of them experience things that put them at higher risk for juvenile justice involvement. Um, I think what we can do and what's the best predictor of reducing that is that mentorship piece, not giving up on them, having that one-on-one -on -one connection. They already have a lot of people in their life that come and go. So if we can just be consistent, um, you know, that would be great and really focus in on that protective factor of, of education. Um, in addition to that, I think one of the great outcomes we see if you have the opportunity is just to be exposed to different experiences. Get sometimes out of the area, get exposed to, you know, things that they can do and be connected with an adult who looks like them and who they can actually see, um, you know, achieving some of the things that that particular adult um, has done, so. Got it, I appreciate that. I'm gonna jump down um, to Miss Paris. Um, is she still here? I am still here, Chairman. Okay, I don't see you. Is that my screen? There you go. Um, I thank you for sharing such unique experience um, that is heartfelt and is genuine. And I'm just excited to see where you are today and to be in a position to give back. Um, one of the things you spoke about was one of the particular programs, I believe it was called Bridges. Um, was it Bridges, yeah, Bridges, Bridges program? program. Yep. Can you elaborate on what that program is, how many youth are involved, and what are the, some of the outcomes of that program? Absolutely. So the Bridges program, what we do is we work with youth who are juvenile involved so they can they're firstly appointed and referred from the court. So it really starts with the court, but those referrals can be advocated through probation officers, social workers. And what we do is we use that one-on-one -on -one mentor model to really be advocates, to advocate for educational needs, advocate for needs in the home. And so what that looks like is once they are referred into the Bridges program, the volunteers who are assigned to our program actually go through additional training that is separate from the training they first got when they came in. And once they're trained to really be able to look at like, you know, trauma-informed care, how to advocate for things that youth may need in the juvenile justice system, those things can be worked with individually with our youth and then with the team. And so what we do is we advocate in court and those outcomes and have proven outcomes where we're reducing recidivism, youth aren't offending while they have causes to hold them accountable. Um, youth are successfully com completing probationary periods. Youth are successfully completing JBDP, which is the Juvenile Behavioral Health Court within their six month period without reoffending. Thank you. I see one of the things you all offer um, was uh, internships. Um, how do you recruit volunteers and interns? What are some requir requirements to do that? I can speak to the summit if I can. I can bounce it over to Alex for a little bit more information on this. But we do have interns who work with CASA DC, and we do have. Um, well, how volunteers are picked. And so we have a volunteer coordinator who specifically works with the recruitment of the volunteers that we have. And so there is an application process where you can apply online, but there's also a supplemental interview. So we're looking at things like the experience they may have had um, in the work that they have done prior. We're looking at how they have engaged with youth. They go through things like a background check. They're, they're fully vetted through that process. Um, to make sure that first, first they're safe in working with kids, but also that the, the skills that they're bringing in and how they're matched with the youth is also a part of that process. So there's an interview, there's an application. And if I missed anything, Alex, if, if it's okay, she can- uh, do you, do you, Can you give me an idea how many youth you are serving? I see, I saw a number on the website. I mean, I, mean, I believe it said 1900 since 2002, but currently how many are you serving now? Currently, so just in the Bridges program, I'm going to say we actively have close to 50 youth. I have a caseload that's upwards, 
getting closer a little bit over 30 and then we have about 10 um, or 15 with other supervisors. So we're serving currently in the Bridges program solely about 50 to 60 youth. Thank you. Um, I want to jump. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I want to jump to Miss Remy Henderson Smith. You can unmute yourself. There we go. Um, I'm excited to hear about the work you are doing um, with the young ladies. I hear about it a, a lot. Um, from people that have benefited from the program. Uh, even some of the men that know about the program, they, they talk about it uh, when I interact with some of the uh, incredible messages affiliated with DYS. Um, how do you uh, recruit the young ladies to be in uh, Dolls and Dreams? So oh, yes, council member, in partnership with DYRS, um, we actually receive, it's internal, so we will receive a referral from the um, DYRS staff. However, most recently, they have opened it up to the community. So now community youth can participate as well. And I think it's such a great strategy that they have implemented it because it, it gives it that sense of accountability, right? If your friend wanna hang out with you and you saying, I gotta go to group, and then maybe they have other ideas, well, guess what? girlfriend can come with you. And that's what's been happening. And it has definitely helped. Um, again, is it, we do understand it's about numbers, but the capacity have increased, but we have also seen such a great outcome. So the recruitment is done internally. How are you able to uh, keep the young ladies consistent during the pandemic? Um, I, the reason why I asked, because I've been able to be in several hearings um, and the numbers have dropped significantly with providing programs for our most vulnerable youth in the district, especially those connected to DYRS. And so I'm just trying to figure out how you keep, keep them connected during the pandemic. Well, uh, most importantly, it is just building that trusting um, relationship. And I can honestly speak from Dolls and Dreams perspective with the um, low capacity, it it's not always because, you know, youth are not showing up. Those young ladies have um, gained employment. So, you know, they're enrolling in school. So it's been a thing of scheduling um, and, you know, conflict in their scheduling. Now, if we were able to get credited to, you know, for a home visit or community visit, then that would be great. But that's not the case. They have to physically be in person. Um, but as I mentioned earlier and on in my testimony, youth who we um, met back early in 2019, they're still in contact with us. So it's just great to have that relationship and pretty much be able to continue to embark on their journey to, to check in with them and just be that support. So do you only provide these services inside the facility? Um, with DYRS, yes. However, Dolls and Dreams does have another platform outside of um, DYRS partnership. Thank you. Um, and I know that, Ben, this is a juvenile detention facility. It's very transient and girls come in and out. How are you able to track, how are you able to uh, track outcomes as it relates to those individuals that may not be in your care long, may come in and out? Um, what's the difficulty in that? I think most importantly, other than them just coming into the weekly sessions, is being able to one, yes, meet them where they are, but also set goals. So we monitor, we have monthly summaries that we follow. So whatever their goals are, um, in support of having a social work and incredible messenger, we are all one team. And so that's how we're able to track, even if it's a sense where the youth have become unresponsive, not physically coming into the AC center, we still can engage outside of, you know, their presence by calling in. And sometimes they, well, not sometimes, all the time, they're calling us, texting us, letting us know, hey, you know, I got housing or, you know, Ms. Remy, I got a job. And so we just celebrate their success, every step that they're taking. How many uh, staff people do you have total? And how many of that staff work uh, specifically with DYRS youth? Um, specifically with DYRS, it's um, two staffs, and then we do have a volunteer who two volunteers who come in periodically. Okay. Yes. Um, and are you working with any other government agencies um, in the district? 
Yes, we are. Um, we are in partnership with Events DC, with um, UPO, Far Southeast Collaborative, um, North Capital Collaborative. Um, oh, it's a lot. Uh, what is that? Community and Schools. Mm -hmm. And I may miss a few, but yeah. those are, yep, yeah, NDYRS. Yes. Right. Miss um, Tiara Free Walker. Am I saying it right? I want to make sure I get it right. Thank you. It was true. How you answer? Oh, true. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> I knew it was something liberating. I knew it. No problem. <laughs> Almost there. Um, you said you were spoken uh, word artist. Um, do you feel like uh, creativity um, is something that has been fostered through the climate of DYS? And what's your take on that? Um, I will have to say that it has. Uh, DYS has been very open in their relationship with me as far as um, allowing the creativity of the youth and what they wanted to do to be open. Um, one of the things that I did uh, more recently was a pamper poetry and paint um, with some girls over at New Beginnings, um, and they took to that very well. And let me tell you, if you get an opportunity, you want to hear some poetry, those young ladies are really powerful. Um, so that the flexibility that DYS has shown over the few years has been really monumental going from spoken word uh, to dealing with music or dance. I've seen, you know, we've had some dance situations as well as the painting um, poetry. So yes, absolutely. Um, what, what can you see that we can do to additionally support you? Uh, the reason why I asked you, because I remember um, when I first came into education as a state board education member, we uh, put a lot of resources and time and energy around STEAM, the STEM originally, then it STEAM, right? And then after a while, I watched it fizzle down because it wasn't as popular nationwide and it wasn't reflected in our budget. But those needs are still there for the young people who, if we don't create positive vehicles for them to express themselves in a positive way, then the alternative is, 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 is happening too. I was in DYS facility probably two and a half, three weeks ago. And I met a young man, um, two young men, one was in college and one had just got there. And the one who just got there, he was explaining to me about his frustration with being locked down for 23 hours. And I wonder what can we be doing differently with the precious time we have while we intervene into these young people's lives um, so that when they return back to the community, they're in better position, more thoughts, more better energy, more encouraged, more wraparound services. So what's your thoughts on what we can do more to give them positive outlets? Um. I feel like the main thing would be consistency. Um, as I mentioned, that Saturday program, that was a great outlet. Um, so to be careful that when a program comes up, not to just allow the numbers to be that reflection because the youth sometimes do go through things, right? Um, and not to be so quick to shut down um, the process um, and give opportunities for them to really be exposed to different things. Like I, I really was taken aback by the reception of spoken word, not just from the females, but also the guys as well. Um, and so what it happens is it really opens them up to the options and the possibility, you know, like art can be a form of skating, you know, so to be able to have them engaging in different forms of art, just for them to check it off to say, hey, I like this or no, I don't like this. That's a form of them knowing who they are and it gives them self-esteem because if they find something that they like um, and it's something that DRS can, you know, carry on who knows where that can go? So it's definitely being able to be open to that support and having it be consistent. Thank you, I appreciate that. I wanna to jump to Mr. Plummer real quick. Um, Mr. Plummer, you talked about your work um, at ERCPCP. Um, and I don't know if you know this, but I started my career, career in youth development at ERCPCP. Um, and it, it, it of course have evolved over time so what it is to check one, check, 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 check. Okay. is it two screens on? There we go. Um, and, and so I, I was encouraged to hear some of the offerings you guys are doing and some of the partnerships that's been forged um, and that's credible messages uh, because it, what we wanna see, I guess from the council and also from the mayor is to get more men and women in young people's lives where they early on where they don't have to have a brush with the law to be able to get support and get help. Um, and so I wanna start off with that. Um, what do you see as some of the immediate needs that's, that's consistent 
amongst young people that you encounter? Um, I'm gonna say um, provision on all levels, you know, from school, housing, and, um, you know, love. I think they lack all these things, right? Love, most importantly, right? Um, they need a safe space to go and learn that recreation centers in different neighborhoods. Um, I think that we need a more community presence in these um, neighborhoods where the shootings are going on at. And let our presence be felt, let our love be felt, uh, let, the, let, the, let the elders know, you know, that we can, we, 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 we listen to what they saying. Um, with going into these schools, whether it's at the elementary level all the way up to high school, let's get into these schools um, and, and let's mingle with them, let's talk to them, let's hear them out, uh, some of their concerns. The credible messenger is, you know, somebody who's credible, who been through what they've been through and who can help guide them along the way. So I'm going to say education is important, you know, proper nourishment, you know, whether they're getting a proper meal at home or whether they come into school getting proper nourishment, uh, tutoring. We need to look into their tutoring, why, why our um, youth are failing in schools and so forth. Um, and then parenting classes. Are the parents doing a proper job with raising these children our, our, in our community? Got it. Um, I guess one of the things I, I'm trying to keen on is about um, the intervention part, right? Right. Um, and getting more people in, in front of them. And I've been right. really having a lot of back and forth with <clears throat> some high level people, I won't say their name, about making sure we are in the schools, right? And I think that early on, it was nobody in the schools. Then it was Anacostia was one of the schools. Then it was moving to three schools. Uh, when we know in DC, we have over 100 plus schools that need the same type of intervention, intervention with people like yourself, um, knowing the culture, understanding the issue, <clears throat> and just having a, the same language uh, that the young people have to intervene. Uh, do you know how many school schools we are in currently? That you okay. know of? We currently, you got the Safe Passage program going on. Um, first, it started last year during the pandemic uh, for youth uh, to come and pick up, you know, food and a schoolwork. Now, we are in, I want to say, uh, I want to say 10 or more schools. Um, the troubled schools um, are the city high schools and uh, some uh, junior high schools where uh, violence is prevalent, uh, credible messages or different community activists under safe passages are there. And uh, they interact with the uh, children that go to these schools. Um, yeah, but safe passage, not to cut you off, safe passage is more so out of school. I see them, okay. and there's not that many right. of them. It's, it's the, the level of engagement is not where it needs to be. It's right. almost like a crossing guard almost. They stand outside in the morning. I see them in the evenings. Um, I'm speaking more so inside the schools, in the cafeterias, in the hallways, because that's the real model. Like when we, before we got to this place, under, um, last leadership of DYS, there was a lot of conversation about building a comprehensive model that we had when I was at ERCPCP and also running my nonprofit. Um, and so outside is good. And you just, it happens for a few, maybe an hour or two, the one in the morning after school, but you outside don't necessarily give you the inside scoop of what the fight that happened throughout the day, who right. was arguing, what's right. happening on Instagram, what's those relationships. And so that's uh, what I'm concerned Cal about. Only two schools right now. We 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 went into two schools. I want to say um, Elliot and another school where we're actually trying to uh, on the DYS put credible message inside the schools, uh, and it's supposed to broaden to other uh, troubled schools, Anacostia and all other schools that's having these um, issues with these neighborhoods. Uh, but it's it's moving at a snail pace, and we hope to propel it further um, in the up and coming year or soon. Thank you. I know that's not solely your responsibility. Just wanted to know if there was some information that I didn't see or that wasn't seen. Um, um, so thank you uh, guys for coming today. Um, we look forward to mocking up this budget to make it a more equitable budget um, to serve our youth in the District of Columbia to ensure that, that we don't see these same youth transitioning uh, into the, to, to the adult penal system. That's very important. We see uh, what's happening um, all over the city with youth and young adults older adults um, and it's, 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 it's beginning to be out of control um, at this point. And so we got to make sure we do everything we can to preserve the life of our community and of the people in the communities. Thank you all for your work. I appreciate what you do on a daily basis. 
I, I know sometimes you don't get recognized, you don't make a trillion dollars, but uh, it's, 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 it's uh, the faith that keeps us in the spirit that keeps us so stay encouraged and keep going. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Have a good day. Two. Now we will move. If I don't, I don't see any other witnesses today, we will move to our government witnesses. Okay. One second. Do you have any other public witnesses? I can't see them if we do. All right. Um, good afternoon, Director Karens. Um, if you have an opening statement, uh, before you give your opening statement, as you know, it's the practice of this office to swear in any government witness. Do you have anyone else from your staff joining you today? Yes, um, but I can't, I don't see any other people pulled in. Um, there should so be Antonio. Their names, we can elevate them on our side. Perfect. Antonio Baxter and Joanne, um, our administrative officer. Antonio is from the OCFO's office. All right, are we, are we waiting for one more person? I see them both now. Okay, I just don't see them. If you could turn your screens on, it'd be helpful because you have to swear you in on the screen and with audio on. There we go. Um, if you can raise your right hand. Do you swear and affirm that the testimony you're about to give today is the, tr the truth and nothing but the truth? Yes. Yes. We're waiting for you, Mr. Baxter. I do. Thank you. I appreciate you guys. Uh, go ahead. Go right ahead, Director, as you start. You can reach other ones. Yeah. Uh, sure. Um, and just wanted to say a quick thank you to all of the witnesses who came to testify today. Um, appreciate it. Um, everyone taking the time out of their day to, to share um, feedback and um, and just, just be here today with us. Um, okay, good afternoon, Chairperson White, members and staff of the Committee on Recreation, Libraries and Youth Affairs. I'm Hillary Cairns, Director of the Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services, and I am joined by members of my senior staff that may assist me with today's hearing. We're here today to provide testimony on Mayor Bowser's fiscal year 2023 fair shop budget, which builds on the recovery budget put forward last year to bolster core city services improve experiences of residents and businesses interacting with the district government and provide greater opportunity for residents to grow, learn, and thrive, giving residents in all eight wards a fair shot. Before I would begin, I would like to thank Mayor Bowser and Deputy Mayor Gelhart for their leadership guidance and support. I was entrusted with the great responsibility of leading DRS and I'm thankful for the opportunity. I would also like to thank colleagues and constituents around the district for their help with the important work we do, providing our city's young people with the best chance to succeed both during and after their time with DRS. Our dedicated staff and service providers work around the clock to build on the strengths of our youth and provide the best continuum of care for them and their families through a wide range of programs, emphasizing personal accountability, public safety, skill development, family involvement, and community support. With this budget, we can be confident that our agency will continue to provide the necessary resources to ensure our youth and families have the tools they need to succeed. This budget ensures that we can continue to help young people avoid further involvement in the juvenile and adult justice systems by providing ongoing support to committed, post-committed and at-risk youth to help them transition to adulthood. This budget exemplifies the district's commitment to public safety investments that support violence prevention and early intervention for at-risk youth investments that build a safer, stronger DC. On a daily basis, 
we serve hundreds of youth and their families between our secure facilities, community-based locations, and our contracted residential services. This includes a combination of committed youth who are placed under DURS's care by a family court judge, post-committed youth who were previously committed to DURS and choose to continue participation in DURS programming, young people charged as adults under Title 16 of the DC Code, detained youth who are awaiting adjudication at either YSC or a shelter home, and the loved ones of each of our youth populations. In addition, in an effort to do our part to reach more young people and steer them away from court involvement, we recently opened our Achievement Center programming to other young people in the district who need our services. By broadening the availability of our service offerings, DURS has a pivotal new opportunity to engage at-risk youth, connect them to resources that positively impact their development, and attempt to curb neighborhood behaviors before they lead to court involvement, negative behaviors before they lead to court involvement. The mayor's fiscal year 2023 budget will help us do our part to support public safety and serve youth and families all over the district. To that end, our achievement centers are welcoming all youth, whether committed to DURS or not, to participate in the wide range of programming that includes social, educational, vocational, and recreational services. Our fiscal year 2023 budget will allow the agency to continue vital programs and partnerships with sister agencies and other community partners who share our goals of reducing instances of violence in the community and preventing further system involvement by, the district, by district youth. The budget includes a $1.97 million investment, which will afford us the opportunity to expand our violence prevention and early intervention efforts to district youth and families outside of DURS. For too long, we have heard residents say young people and their families should not have to be committed to DURS to receive the necessary supports to help keep those young people from further involvement in the justice system. So I'm ecstatic that our FY23 budget finally provides us the opportunity to address these, this issue head on. For, 20, for FY23, we are excited to announce that DURS is starting a program to serve additional youth and families. While I'm intimately familiar with the excellent diversion programs already offered throughout the district, a hole remains for young, those young adults who may be heading down the wrong track, but have not yet reached a point where they would be committed to DURS for the long term. These are the youth, along with their families, we will focus this work on. The goal of this program will be to prevent further system involvement for those young people while also providing the necessary supports to their loved ones. Available service will, services will include pairing youth with credible messengers and providing family and individual therapy, workforce development, and academic assistance. DURS is the ideal agency to handle this initiative due to our infrastructure. We will be able to model off of our existing practices, utilize our community programming and restorative justice-based approach. Our programming and operations will be expanded to the specific population. The foundation is already laid. The plan is to launch a program to serve youth and families referred to DURS using additional staff provided in the budget. Referrals will come from our sister agencies, such as DHS, the ONE's Office, the Police Department, the Office of Gun Violence Prevention, and Child and Family Services Agency. The, the philosophy behind this approach, approach stems from the recognition that certain behaviors, such as truancy, and anger and even violence are often an expression of need. So as Mayor Bowser states, we must invest in our young people, not just punish them, but support them. These in investments reflect this approach. To further support public safety efforts and to engage more youth and families district-wide, DRS's fiscal year 2023 budget includes more than $4 million for our Credible Messenger initiative. Credible messengers are vital resources for the success of our young people because they live in the same communities and share similar lived experiences with those they serve. All youth should be connected to caring adults, services, supports, and opportunities that enable them to successfully transition into adulthood. Incredible messengers are uniquely positioned to help engage young people and their family members and connect them to the resources they need to thrive. Currently, Credible Messengers serve DURS youth in both secure and community-based settings. They provide mentoring and violence intervention services at several DC public schools and will soon be at the Southwest Library. They also work with approximately 29 child and family services agency youth in need of their services. The expanded Credible Messenger services will include $350,000 for dedicated bilingual Credible Messengers and provide Credible Messenger support to youth who are not involved with the justice system. Providing these services both to committed youth and to the broader community allows us to maximize the impact of our credible messenger resources. As we look ahead, we look forward to the expanded reach of credible messengers and other enhancements to our community programming made possible through this budget. In closing, I would like to thank my colleagues at DRS, community-based organizations, 
advocates, neighborhood leaders, and our sister agencies for their commitment to our youth and their loved ones. As you know, this is challenging work and daily dedication from those who work tirelessly to serve and support our youth and families around the, the clock is incredible. I would also like to recognize the youth and families with whom we work alongside every day. We are inspired by their resilience, courage, and willingness to do the hard work that will lead to strengthening themselves and our communities. Thank you, Chairperson White, for your leadership and for the opportunity to address the Committee on Recreation, Libraries, and Youth Affairs. We look forward to our continued partnership and expanding upon the promising work that has and will be done to improve results for all youth throughout the district. I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you, Director. Um, just to start off, can you tell us how many youth you have um, that you oversee, both in the facilities and outside of facilities total? I'm sure. So uh, there are 107 committed youth. Um, and so you know, those are the people that are formally committed to the agency. We have another about 45 post-committed youth who are continuing to research, re receive services. Um, we have 19 Title 16 youth who are at YSC who are receiving services. Um, and then, you know, the number what really the varies. the number for Title 16? I'm sorry. 19. And then, um, you know, through YSC, we get uh, pre-adjudicated youth that are, you know, under supervision or pre-trial -super, pre supervision of uh, court social services. Um, so, I mean, and then we also work with families of our young people. So, you know, on a daily basis, it's several hundred young people and, and parents, you know, caregivers and parents we're working with. Um, do you see, so what was, what was, can you compare how many we see now versus how many had over the years? Is the number increasing or decreasing? So the over, like the number of committed youth has gone down a fair amount over the past couple of years. Um, but we've, you know, we've in, expanded in other ways. So we're really pressing on our post-commitment services. We're, like I said, a little over 40 now, but this is an area where I'm really focused and our team is focused on expanding our reach with young people who were formerly involved with us. Um, and then, you know, we, we didn't have Title 16 youth until a couple of years ago. So that, you know, that, that's a number that's increased for us. And then, sorry, and then, you know, I know I mentioned in my testimony, the Achievement Center expansion. So we expect our numbers in the Achievement Centers to go up. We, we just opened up to community members um, a month ago. Okay, well, I see that the, um... The budget is going up when the amount of youth seems to be stagnant, stagnant or going down. Um, I, just trying to get some clarity on why, why, why we put more money into an agency that's seeing less youth. Can you give me some justification on that? Sure. I mean, I think you know the budget looks bigger than it is when you think about the some of the core like fixed costs that we have. So when you add up the costs of managing our two facilities. Uh, maintaining our shelters, which we have to for court social services involved youth, and then our group homes in the community, we're at almost $60 million just covering those kind of the housing and everything that goes along with managing those different facilities. So, you know, so then we're starting with, you know, our budget is um, like 30 million, okay, when you talk about other services. And we, our budget has gone down in the past couple of years. I know that there's an increase for this year, which I can you know, explain the rationale for the increase, um, but we really have cut a lot out over the past couple of years, recognizing you know, in acknowledgement that, that our numbers have gone down. But again, a vast, you know, a huge portion of our funding is, is fixed costs managing those facilities. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm also concerned about programming. Um... I think we have a number of providers that are doing great. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in seeing how we can do much more. I know two years ago, we put more money in the budget for credible messengers. Um, but the following year, there was not an increase in credible messengers. Um, I'm concerned that we put money into the agency, but DRS is not hiring those individuals we need to be out in the community doing intervention and building relationships. Uh, do you know since then, have we hired those individuals that was budgeted um, in the 2020 budget? Uh, I That predates me. I can't speak yeah, to no. the intricacies of, of that increase and, and potential hiring that was supposed to happen. What I can tell you is that we have we currently have uh, 56 credible messengers 
And um, you see that our budget increase request for this year includes uh, money for bilingual cutover messengers and then um, also the violence intervention and prevention program, which we're establishing would include additional credible messenger services. And the credible messengers that we have, you know, I know it was touched on by, um, I believe it was Mr. Plummer talked about, you know, we have the one-on-one -on -one credible messenger services that are happening for all young people committed to the agency, as well as our Title 16 youth are getting credible messenger services, but we're also, we are trying to expand our scope and feel that we, we have a really important role to play. This is an area of great pride and expertise for the agency. Um, we're working with several schools to, um, to be working within the schools. I know you, ex you express that as an area of interest for you as well. And then, uh, you know, also working with Child and Family Services Agency, youth, and then uh, we're in negotiation with uh, the library system about uh, doing a program out of a Southwest library. Yes. Um, and could you have your staff to research um, for the last three years, what's the number of total credible messengers? Because um, we're hoping to get that number up. 50 something is not enough for a city that's going through a a crisis as it relates to violence, especially youth-related violence. Um, I was in a community two nights ago when a car flipped over, where some juveniles jumped out, what, what looked like having handguns in their hand and ran down the street. Um, when you when I'm at the community meetings, I'm hearing a lot of conversation just from our senior citizens just being afraid to come outside. Um, and I'm not putting this on DYS per se, but I'm just trying to figure out what are we doing um, from not just DYS, but also core social services and also the attorney general to kind of have a balance um, in redirecting our young people, even on the prevention side. And that's why I'm pushing for more credible messengers to be not just uh, in a facility in the community, because the model is really a trying one in one model, meaning in a facility, in the community, and in and, and, and schools. And so we mentioned that school part, that's when youth are coming together, that's where a lot of this, situations that happen or exploding or meeting places. Um, I think that if we don't integrate that into the model, it's a broken model. And we're seeing the melees happen over and over again, even how some of our youth getting killed, killed at the school. Um, so you can get me that information that will be helpful. And while you're doing it, I'm gonna go to my next question. Um, from the FY22 to FY23 budget, there has been a 275% increase in the capital budget. Uh, can you elaborate on what the expectations of that money will be used for? Sure. Yeah, the increase for our capital budget is to cover some pretty significant upgrades at YSC. So including the HVAC system, showers, um, some reconfiguration to improve the programming and other spaces at YSC. So that's the vast majority of it. And then there's a portion of that money that's covering uh, fleet replacements. What is the capacity uh, level at both facilities and where are we in FOS being at that capacity? Do you mean a uh, number of young, of young people at each facility? Yes. Okay. Uh, YSC has a capacity of 88. Uh, I pulled numbers last Thursday, I think, and we were at 62 at YSC. And then um, New Beginnings capacity is 60. And I believe today we're at 23. One of the things I've, I've been reading was the fast growing population of African American females being detained. Are we seeing that reflected? Because I heard the numbers were less than five in one facility, uh, maybe around the same in the other. If any, I don't. I know I heard less than five. Are we seeing that reflected in our numbers in DC in our juvenile juvenile justice system? Yeah. I, I, I want to get you exact numbers because I don't want to I don't want to misstate. But what I would say is, you know, at YSC, we uh, have two girls at New Beginnings. We have three girls. DRS committed youth. We have 12 girls um, at our shelter house, which is Chloe's house, at Sasha Bruce. I believe those numbers have gone up a little. I'm just looking to see if I could find the exact number. There are three young people placed there, but I'm happy to you know work with MPD to get you know, all of the, the exact numbers about girls. Thank you, that's helpful. Um, I guess I'm also concerned about housing. One of the things I encounter uh, with young people, I had to go visit a young man this last week who was a gunshot victim for the third time. 
and he's just turned 18. First shot when he was 10, again, when he was, I guess, 14, and then last week. Um, and one of the priorities that I keep hearing over and over that's recurring is access to housing. How are we using these dollars to ensure that those who get referred by the courts or by mentors around housing wraparound services get put in the place they need to be with our providers? Because I think the last hearing we had, we heard that uh, most of the facilities wasn't at capacity or um, didn't have any youth there. And I know that's not all on DYS, but we want to make sure we are using that model to ensure we create wraparound service for our young people who are in our care. Yeah, so I mean, the, the shelter homes that we have are specifically, those are to be used for court, young people who are involved with court social services. So those are not open facilities for other people to be placed in. And similarly, our group homes are for DRS youth who are placed there. Um, that said, uh, I agree that there is absolutely yeah, um, a need for housing. For clarity, Director, I'm speaking to DYS youth, not talking about anybody else. Got um, it. Okay. Um, so we had we had a we had a facility that had a capacity, I believe, it was for seven to eight people, had one person in there. You know, we talked about it. So I want to. Yeah. Go yeah, so. yeah, that's right. I mean, but we're only we're placing based on need. So if if a young person is in need of group home level support, that's where a young person will be placed. We're not, you know, we're not going to put young people who aren't appropriate to be placed there into a group home setting. So. Um, I, I, I hear that and I appreciate that answer. I do know that when uh, my staff and I visited DYS at New Beginnings, uh, we engaged a young man who said he was not even supposed to be detained at, um, he wasn't at New Beginnings at YIC, I, I apologize. And he was there only because he hasn't been placed in a group home. He was a young man I encountered in the boxing program. I think I called you shortly thereafter. Um, I'm trying to figure out what is the mix up and hold up if they are, told they are going to a group home or some type of living facility while they come into YIC. What's the hold up between the courts and, and DYS? Um, so my recollection on that young person is that he was to be placed in a shelter home and we had a one day delay um, due to the shelter home being full. So that was the specifics on him. Um, in terms of other placements, I mean, our goal is to get them out of YSC as soon as possible. Our, we don't currently have, you know, our group homes have space. There sometimes are challenges with our, our out of state placements that may take a bit longer because there, there are legal things that have to happen before a young person can be placed out of state. Again, our goal is not to set, have young people placed out of state, but when it's deemed to be a safety need or a special therapeutic in, intervention that's needed, there, there, there are sometimes delays, honestly, in getting those placements done. Okay. Um, and I don't know if he was there. I believe he was there for more than one day, but I'm um, just concerned. I mean, that's just one person I encountered that day as an example. So I don't know what was going on in other spaces and places inside the facility, but I did want to highlight uh, that to you. Um, for FY22, um, the overtime was approved for 1.8 million to date. Can you give us an idea how much been, has been spent? Yeah, we've spent about $1.4 million, between $1.4 $1.5 million already this year. So this has been a challenging year for us with um, Omicron um, that greatly impacted our use of overtime in, over the winter, in particular, so December, January, even into February. And um, so for FY23, we anticipate that because we, we have done a huge hiring effort, we have, uh, I believe, 20, I think it's 27 YDRs that are in the pipeline for hiring once we're fully staffed, which has been a challenge for us for the last um, two years. Once we're fully staffed, we anticipate that our overtime numbers will go down and we, we anticipate that that will happen starting the summer. Got, got you, and, I, and I'm concerned about that, being as though um, most of the money has gone out the door and we're not even close to September, October at the moment. But I did see that you had an increase of 4.3 million and 14 FTEs for this year's budget. Um, I believe 11 of those FTEs would go towards youth and family empowerment. Uh, can you elaborate on what that looks like in helping the agency get to its intended goals? 
Sure. Um, first and foremost, there's an error in the budget submission. So six of those FTEs are errors and will be removed in the final submission. So new FTEs, there are eight, and they're all part of the enhancement request for uh, the violence uh, prevention intervention program. Um, so overall, the budget increase, the $4.37 million increase for FY23 includes about $2 million for those new FTEs, as well as step increases for our existing employees, and then uh, around $800,000 to support credible messengers, cognitive behavioral therapy, community-based providers for the new um, initiative. And then we also have uh, close to $500,000 more to support the education programming at Youth Services Center, which is now managed by Maya Angelou. Also included is the additional bilingual credible messengers, which is another $350,000, and then um, money for some increases for a custodial contract. And then um, I know you met uh, Mr. Jordan from the Office of Juvenile, I, I'm bad with acronyms, Office of Ju Juvenile Justice Facility Oversight. Uh, yes. I, I didn't get it quite right. <laughs> There's a little bit in there. I think he mentioned when we met last Friday at the hearing, they, they have to call in experts for certain um, types of investigations they're doing. So there's a small increase for them. And then we have some additional staff training dollars. So all of that together gets you to the 4 million. Got it. Um, I will have some deeper conversation about that. Um, the URS uh, came under fire for having a gap in services to some degree with education provider. Um, can you tell us where we are with that provider and the um, the cost, if anything went up, if it went down, is it relatively stable? Because um, that's a huge concern we, that our young people, while they're in DYS custody, they're getting uh, adequate education and support. And I, I did want to note that I met at least two gentlemen there that were in, were in college at UDC. I was very, very impressed with that. And we are following up with them. And I committed to uh, hiring one as an intern so we're waiting for him to finish up there so he can join us because he's a very brilliant young man with the interest in politics um, and this community engagement. Yeah, so in terms of the schooling, I just, I wanna clarify, there wasn't a gap. I mean, what we, we shifted from DCPS being the contractor provider at Youth Services Center to Maya Angelou being that provider. We actually had overlap to make sure that there wouldn't be any gap when it first started um, in August. I think it was August or perhaps it was the beginning of September. So, the, and the cost for Maya, our portion of the cost for Maya is more than we paid DCPS because um, DC public schools also got their own per pupil funding that happened through a different source. So our, our contract at YSC um, is a little over $3 million. It's comparable to our contract at New Beginnings, also to Maya Angelou C Forever Foundation, a little over $3 million. And um, you're right to point out, we do have several young people who are in college, and I'm, I'm really glad that you got to meet uh, two of them when you were there, but we absolutely are supporting their schooling um, at, at YSC. So uh, am I correct in saying that money for the education for even Maya Angelou comes out of DYS budget? Because that should be an education budget. Yes, we, we contract with them for, uh, for education at both YSC and at New Beginnings. Yeah, I have to look deep into that. That sounds, I mean, there are, it's a public school, even though it's a public charter school, correct? Well, it's not, I, and I don't know, um, Joanne, if you feel like you could answer better than I about this. Um, they're not, I don't believe they're functioning as a charter school officially in their capacity at the two sites. Like we're paying for their, we're basically purchasing a school from them, but Maybe I'm not phrasing that yeah, correctly. I'm concerned about that because DC, um, if you're a youth in DC, you're entitled to an education. And so we allocate money in education per student. So I'm not sure what the nuances is that an agency has to pay a school to educate our children when they already, I mean, they're kids. They get, a, I mean, they get a contract through a school system through I see, yeah, what, can somebody give us, give me some clarity on that? Cause I'm, I'm confused about that. So I can just add that we work closely with the Department of Education and I believe that they did their own assessment of the type of 
uh, institution we were using and based on their criteria determined that it wouldn't it wouldn't fit in that model so they put us in a different model but yeah we still pay out of our local budget for these services we do receive some funding from from that from the department of education to or from OSSI, i should say um, to help support the gap that we have in our local budget and the contracted services but i think they're the ones who determine whether or not the the school is one that would be funded under them or through us and, and just to go a little deeper, <clears throat> can you give me an idea of the offerings? Because I know we're dealing with different age youth that's come in maybe six months, you know, maybe two months, maybe two days. I don't know um, how we uh, ensuring that they we are addressing their needs academically while they're in DYS care. Yeah. So first off, I can I can definitely talk to um, our legal team to get you a firm answer on kind of on the rationale for why we're paying out of pocket. I think there's a simple legal answer. I just don't know it. Um, the yeah. So young people who come through YSC, uh, there's an educational assessment that's up, that's done to figure out where they are um, educationally to make sure that we're appropriately school, get, providing education service to them while they're at YSC. Similar to similarly at New Beginnings, um, you know, but once a young person is committed to DRS, a lot of um, assessments are done prior to their being committed. So a psychoeducational, which is going to talk about their educational needs, you know, their if they have special education needs, their individualized education program is going to come with them. So we we have to abide by all of those to make sure that they're getting. Uh, they're fully supported educationally. So within the, you know, within both schools, there are special, special education services, intensive tutoring that's available at both sites. Thank you. I'm gonna jump around a little bit if you may. Um, I see that um, the security services line was approved for 53,000, but then this amount has been removed uh, what has been done for security services and the effect of this service not being continuing FY 23? Yeah, that was just a small reduction in the security contract. We, we pay DGS. So that was a reduction that, that happened through them. So it's not, there's no reduction in services. It's just a, a savings on the contract. Okay. I guess it's always a good thing that we still keep in quality service. Um, was the Office of the General Counsel changes? Uh, can you speak to, I, I think I saw, I'm looking at a $127,000 change from FY22 to FY23, uh, which has a FTE leaving the agency or relocating to another area at DYRS. Yeah, so it's just a one FTE reduction in the General Counsel's office. So for our General Counsel's office, we have a General Counsel two attorney advisors and then a hearing officer and that's 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 all we need got it can you elaborate on removing the one-time cost for youth and family programs of six hundred thousand, and its impact on drs so this is one where it, it, it's challenging to follow sometimes the way things come across on the budget um, it, the $600,000 reduction, it was a one-time funding. It's added back in for a new one-time funding, um, the $1 million. So it's actually a $400,000 increase in funding, and that's to support the education contract at YSC. You said it's an increase instead of a decrease? So there was a removal of a $600,000 one-time fund funding, and then there was an addition, so a removal of the FY22 one-time funding of $600,000, and then in FY23, there was a, a putting back in of a million dollars, um, which in, so that a net of a little over $400,000. Got it, got it. And what does this cause, what does this one-time time cause do and if, it's, if it is essential? Wow, is it re not recurring? Uh, I don't, I, I'm not familiar with why things sometimes are one time versus recurring. Maybe Antonio could speak to that. Yeah, I think that one time funded is, is how the budget is laid out. Um, and it has to do with like continuing service funding level. So I think how funds got categorized is the answer to that. What is, what is the fund used for? 
I think it was like the additional funding was for the education. Um, it was like the 600,000 was for education. Then they took it out and then put back in a million for the educational expenses. Yeah, it's, it's specifically for the contract at U Services Center to support the, it, it costs more than it did when we had DCPS there. Because this comes from the Office of Education, they, it's part of their recurring, their own recurring budget. So every year they have to reassess how much based on their formulary, they are going to budget in their submission for these services. So that's why it's a one-time funding instead of it being recurring. They do a they do an assessment based on the number of kids we have, and um, they have a formulary and a shell that they kind of plug numbers into, and it spits out an amount every year for us. So it Got can it. change based on population. Got it. Um, and doing my visit, I am concerned about the mental health of our young people there, um, and I've seen a reduction um, in health and wellness, especially still in a pandemic. Let's not forget that. Uh, there was a reduction approximately 397000 almost $400,000. Can we speak to the impact of what's going to have on our agency goals? Yeah, that it, do, it actually does not have any impact on the services being provided. Um, it's mainly the result of some vacancy savings that are occurring. Um, you know, I too absolutely share your, your desire to ensure that we have full health and wellness programming, which, and again, this is not reducing it at all. And I don't know if uh, council member, when you were at the facilities, if you were able to talk to any of our behavioral health services teams, um, but we have a lot of, of really important programming that's happening at both facilities. So trauma focused groups, um, individual, individual work, um, really feel confident and comfortable with the level of services that we have in the facilities. Okay. Um, in the public uh, round table that we had last week, uh, Mark Jordan, um, on the Office of Independent Juvenile Justice Facilities Oversight, there we go, discussed their excess assessment of the lack of staffing in YSC. Um, what, are, what is the agency doing to ensure that we can um, have the staff, have the facilities adequately staffed to provide adequate services? Yeah, so I don't know, Councilman, if you've gotten a chance yet to see the report that they published around staffing, but they did, I think it was a seven day look at staffing at YSC and New Beginnings. It happened to be at a really terrible time for us to be frank. It was in the middle of Omicron and we were pulling staff every which way to make sure that we met the, you know, we, we kept our facilities up and running in a way that was safe. Um, like I said, the, we are right now, so we're all the way back. I, you would not, if, if they were to do the staffing report right now, I think it would be a 300 and whatever the circle is, 360 degree uh, difference in what, what was experienced in December. That said, we also have, like I said, we have nearly 30 YDRs that are in the pipeline for hiring. And once that happens, um, we'll be in an even better position, particularly around overtime. Got it. Um, I did hear some grumbling um, as relates to um, doing it. I guess when we started asking about the allegations of the sexual assault from a staff person to one of the youth involved, and I guess staff felt like their voices wasn't heard. I'm not sure the actual staff, it was you coined as a supervisor. And I believe you said it's one for each facility and some concern about the morale as relates to those who are there. Um, what if any mental health services are we providing and support services to the staff that's there to keep their morale good because how they feel is transferred to how they treat uh, the young people there. Yeah, I, I appreciate that council member. I mean, I too share um, your concern that it is so important that we support our staff in any way possible, including uh, making sure that they're able, you know, they get care themselves when needed. What we've done is, you know, we, we've encouraged our staff to access um, the service that are, are available through the employee assistance program. We also have spaces within the buildings that are set aside for them to take 
breaths, <laughs> take time away while, while they can. So definitely want to be supporting in any way possible. And I've had a lot of individual conversations um, as well with, um, with, with staff about this. You said take rest. Can you explain what you mean by allow them to take rest? What is that process? Um, so we have what are they're called peace rooms and they're just they're sort of more comfortable spaces in the building where staff can go take their breaks also i i think i maybe mentioned in our performance hearing we also got a grant from the office of victim services and justice grants for this year which are allowing us to add more support within those peace rooms as well as um, hopefully really soon we're going to have all staff will have free access to the calm app on their phones which is you know which is a really helpful app to use the talk mindfulness meditation other ways to just practice self-care thank you um now new be new beginners facility is there any plans in the immediate future to put any major renovations there or build anything else on that land there so we've submitted a request for some for construction of some mo a modular vocational training facility on a Laurel campus. That that's new beginnings. It has not been approved, but you know we're hopeful, looking forward, that there may be an opportunity for some remodeling there that would allow us to expand our vocational offerings. Do you know the estimated cause of that? Mm, I several million dollars to do like sort of like on the the most extreme end like around five to six million dollars got it um how are we doing with the uh fleet as their vehicles um i saw there was a in the budget there was about 1.3 million for fleet replacement i'm not sure what type of vehicles if you can speak to that Sure. So we were part of the the executive office of the mayor's plan to make sure that we're you know refurbishing when possible or replacing our our vehicles. And so that's what the the increase is for that. Um, I'm looking. I have some numbers. It's to replace sub seven light duty vehicles. So those are like regular cars and vans, one truck and two heavy duty um, vehicles. So things that are used for snow and moving equipment and so special kind of truck. Sorry, I was muted again. Um. Title 16 youth. Um, how many staff do we have allocated to work with that population? What's the, uh, the youth to staff ratio? Um, with our um, Title 16 U? So the Title 16 units, uh, I believe there are three Title 16 housing units at YSC. Um, I hope I'm saying that correctly. And um, at, so like I said, there are 19 uh, Title 16 youth that are placed at YSC. The, the, the YDRs, so the youth development representatives that are serving those units. Um, we do tend to, to have um, people assigned to the same unit over, you know, repeatedly so that they're developing relationships with young people. At any given time, there, there should be two YDRs that are assigned to that unit. So, you know, you're talking about six to six staff to 19. So like a one, it's almost like a one to three ratio. Um, but that's just our staff. So we also have credible messengers that are working with them. We have a super, you know, supervisory um, staff that are there as well. And just to clarify, sorry, the, an over, I don't want to, overnight, there's usually only one YDR that's assigned to a unit because um, people are sleeping and they have restrooms within their own, uh, within their own room. So I know that um, in D.C. we have mandated through um, the federal government uh, that D.C. must have what is now called the CIC, Correction Information Council, um, that's responsible for checking up on uh, D.C. inmates that's throughout the country. Um, but how does DYS specifically check on those youth who are already gone? Um, because we've probably had a, over 40 in the last three years that's kids that's gone to the federal penitentiary. 
How do we check on them? What are some of the checks and balances? Do we still support them financially? Are they still assigned the mentors? What's the follow up with them after they get transported to the, to the DOF system? Yeah, so I do think the CIC exists still. So they, they would be doing their monitoring and their support um, in terms of young people who have been, who have spent time with us before they were moved to Bureau of Prisons, we are providing continuing credible messenger support for them. What does that look like? Are they, is it part of their duty to call them? Is it part of their duty to check on them, write them? What does that look like? I'm not speaking, I don't, I'm trying to get more specific than being broad. Yeah, um, I, I don't want to. I don't want to misspeak. If there are very firm expectations, like a certain number of contacts each week, I can. I can absolutely find out for you what the exact um, requirements are for the credible messengers. Please, that's helpful for me, um, because it, we we know that all those young men and ladies um, will be returning back to the community at some point. Um, and you know, they, 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 it says re-entry re starts at the point of entry and we already have them engaged, already have relationships. Just wanna make sure we're not breaking those relationships as they go out. Um, we're following up on those individuals. As you can get that information before sure. we can. Um, does all the cameras in DYS work in both facilities and other locations? Uh, yes, I mean they, they've all been recently updated, actually. So at both at both facilities, um, the they're all operating correctly. Okay, I noticed that um, according to the capital improvement plan, DYS has engaged in a security consultant to look through its surveilling cameras. Um, have they sent an analysis of what they found about the functionality of the cameras? Uh, some type of report. I'm not. I'm not familiar with that um, project that you're talking about. We, we we did have a security consultant work with us several years ago, and that's what led to the you know the redo um, to make sure that we you know were covering blind spots and make sure that our system was upgraded. So I'm not familiar of anything more recent than that. We don't. We're not currently doing a reassessment. Just get back. I apologize for that, ladies and gentlemen who are watching. Um, technology, it works when it, when, it, when it works to do, when it don't, it don't, so. But I got three phones. Okay. Yeah, so we're gonna work this thing. I see one. Is on four percent. One phone is on. Say again. Eight percent. If you, hey, Cal, if you all can mute your phone, it'd be beneficial to be. All right. I apologize again, director. No problem. Computer just went out. I guess we're talking about the. 
um, trying to get an idea from that report. If those cameras, is a report reflecting that our cameras are good, is there any additional money to be spent? What are the findings from the cameras? <coughs> Um, pardon me. Uh, so no. So I, I was saying, and maybe we may have gotten cut off in the middle. That we we do not have a. We're, we're updated with our cameras. Those are both re recently updated, so we're good. That's great to hear. Um, what uh, will there be money allocated to increase the safety of youth in custody? Um, is there something in particular? So I, I think, you know, like I said, cameras are updated, um, getting our, uh, so we're, we're not looking at any kind of changes to the structure of the building, to our, um, you know, the way the housing units and stuff are set up. So, you know, most importantly, it's following all, you know, in terms of safety, it's following all the policies and procedures that we have in place to ensure a safe environment. So, you know, that's, the, those are potentially areas for improvement in terms of training and stuff though, um, you know, and I think I mentioned that in the, the hearing last Friday, that that's what we're looking at, but we don't have, we don't have a need for financial support to do any upgrades. Yeah. And I'm, I guess I'm concerned about that um, because I know that we had some critical incidents happening in the facility with the allegations that are in court or will be in court soon. I'm just want to know what are we learning from that and what are we doing differently? And if those things that we are doing differently as an agency, does it has any financial impact that we need to be concerned about going forward with this budget? Um, because you know, this old saying, you do the same thing over and over again and expect a different outcome is the definition of insanity. And the agency puts itself in a place to be vulnerable if uh, we're not making adjustments, um, not just in policy and procedures, but also allocating money in the right ways to ensure safety on youth on youth, youth on the daughter, daughter on youth, and all the way around. So if the answer is no, then I, you know, I, I, I take that, but I do wanna hear from the agency at some point about what are we gonna do differently to provide safety for our youth in the city. Yeah, so currently the answer is no, we're not seeking additional funds. Got it. Um, I asked earlier about the three years. Um, did you get that answer to that question yet? I think it was around. What's the three years? Uh, was it around the amount of youth that were in the facility for the last three years? Um, are you talking about DRS committed youth? Do you want the numbers for the last couple of years or overall facility? Somebody should be known. Um, also, oh, credible messengers in the last three years. That is, thank you, Dr. Jackson. Okay. Based on the money we put in the budget, where are we from? What happened to that money? As far as the money for the credible messengers, and Antonio, if I must speak, please. Um, please jump in. But the, the year that the funding was put into our budget for those things, we had an overall net decrease in that area. But what we did do was adjust our, our internal budget accordingly to hire um, what we call credible messenger violence prevention specialists. So they're very similar to our credible messengers, but they don't have a dedica dedicated caseload of kids. They don't um, kind of have that same structure, but they are out in the community. They're connecting uh, the community members to, they're essentially liaisons that are connecting them, connecting them to resources. They don't have um, a specific cohort of youth, but they are in the, in the community doing violence prevention efforts. And so that's what the funding has been um, and we have found funding at, we've allocated funding for that every year since to make sure that we maintain those, those folks. And I believe there are, there are three organizations I know for sure. So I, I want to say maybe there's six total of those violence prevention specialists, and um, we can get back to you exactly on how many there are, but that is something we've been doing every year since. Antonio, please, if I misspoke about the, the net we, increase. Yeah, that would be helpful for me, for me. So, and 2019 we had this many in 2020 we had this money but in 2020 we added this to this number which is a different title a different responsibility but essentially it helps the same population we have this number in 2022 this number like that is helpful for me that's kind of what i'm looking for okay we can get that to you 
when? I mean, that's what I'm asking. We asked this an hour ago. I don't know that it's feasible to get it like literally right now as we're talking, but. Um, budget. So budget is based on line items, correct? And then each line item has an allocation for staffing. I mean, how we, this is a budget oversight. And so we have to, my job is to analyze how we're spending our money in the most efficient way to ensure we can get the best outcomes. And we all can agree that credible messages is critical uh, in doing this work, especially expanding beyond just what happens inside the four walls of a facility. Um, and so I have to be able to get an answer on money we put into an agency a few years ago. If those people were hired or they were in a pipeline, they got hired, if it transitioned from this to this, that's the that's my responsibility. So I, I had to get I have to get that information. information. Sure. Yeah, I I absolutely hear you. So can we can commit to getting it to you by the end of the day? If that if like so what I heard was find out 2019, 2020, 2021, 22, 22, 2023, all the credible messengers, the other positions too, the violence interrupters. We also have family engagement specialists that um, that are part of the, that work as well. Make sure that you have the full picture for what the funding has supported over the years. Yes, you can go back three years. I don't have to go back too far, but I just want to okay. accountability measures. Um, we have to show, you know, this is these are tax dollars and we yep. intent. So the former director came to a hearing, say we need more money for this. And so we work with them to give them more money for this. But when we came back the next year, nobody, nothing was increased. And so now we're here two years later trying to figure out it was increased. We're saying, yeah, we increased it, but we increased it with a new title. Like, what does that mean? Where are they? What's their responsibility? How many? I think I heard six or seven. But I need some accurate numbers that can be helpful to me. Absolutely. So we'll be, I guess, we'll be looking for that information. I would like to get the information on public records. Yes, okay. Um. Director, can you speak to the cost of maintenance um, in general? Not a specific amount, but I want to make sure that uh, being the store that we are in a pandemic still and cleaning supplies and, and uh, you know, cleaning, cleaning is very important, uh, not just the upkeep of the building with the structure, but also the cleaning of the building. I know we're not under the same restricted cleaning that we once were, um, but I'm concerned that we are keep that keep the facility clean, and if that has any cost to it, additional cost. Um. So I'm showing for facility maintenance, it's about seven hundred and forty thousand dollars. But I'm not. Are you talking about beyond facility, also including like our achievement center? Achievement centers, our office spaces. More concerned about those, um, the detention facilities that operate 24 hours. Um, Antonio, am I missing anything or is $740,000, does that include everything? I think if I understand the council, uh, chairman's question correct, you're asking, uh, has there been like uh, an increase in costs associated with cleaning, like custodial contract with COVID-19 uh, protocols? Um, and the answer to that question would be yes. Uh, the agency increased that amount like 200,000 and that contract falls under risk management. It would be in the risk management um, activity area in the agency management program. Got it. Um, and for services, are we still directly um, mm -hmm. Contracting with Progressive Life um, to then subcontract with the other agencies. Can you give me an update on, on how the grant cycle is working with that and roughly how many community partners do we have? Yeah, so we do currently have a contract with Progressive Life Center and then they are subcontracting, subgranting to 
uh, let's see, we have seven, seven credible messenger programs, six uh, providers in the achievement centers. So 13 total, uh, maybe off by one or two, but yes, that is our current, the solicitation um, uh, goes out this summer. So they're, they're a provider through the end of this fiscal year and, and maybe reapplying for the new solicitation for services. Do we still have the uh, Grow Your Own? Uh, forgive me if I'm messing up the name. Grow Your Own? Grow Up? Program? Grow Up, Grow Out? Grow Up, Grow Out. Yeah, there it is. Sorry. Um, yeah, what, there, sure. Elaborate on what that program is, what they do, and the costs. Uh, grow Up, Grow Out is our credible messenger program in the facilities. So they're at both YSC and New Beginnings, and um, they are sub sub contracted through Progressive Life Center as are our other credible messenger providers. And their FY22 budget is 547,000. Okay, uh, how many, are they, are they contractors? Yeah, they're contracted through Progressive Life. Okay, so they're contractors of Progressive Life as a subcontractor. How, yes. much, is the total, how much is the total uh, budget for Progressive Life? Um, Joanne, are you able to speak to that? I can do some math while I'm sitting here. 7.6 million right now. 7.6 million. And, and I guess of that, how many, how much goes out from, to the community organizations of that? So we do a an 80-20 split for our community programming initiative. So 80% of it is out to our community, so community services and 20% goes to PLC. So it breaks out to be about 1.2, 1.3 million for the administration of it, which would be to Progressive Life Center and the rest goes to community service, to their service coalition, credible messengers and direct services to youth. Now has that fund increased over the years or remained steady? It's been pretty steady. Okay. And are we able to still provide the same level of services um, with, I guess, inflation, uh, cost of living going up? Yes, what we do every year is right size based on need. So if there is a higher cost somewhere else, but we're seeing a savings in other places, we'll just adjust funding in those areas to support. Any other large contracts like uh, Grow Up, Grow Out? Am I saying it right? Yeah, that's right. Th theirs is um, in line with our other credible messenger contracts. The other ones are actually a little bit higher. They're each around six hundred fifty thousand. So uh, oh, that's a that's a uh, the name of an organization that got the grant to do credible messenger. Grow Up Grow Out is in is our facility based credible messenger team. The other the other six are community based. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Um, one second, I then lost my computer, but I do want to let the public know. Uh, Director, do you have any other final comments? Um, no, thank you. We will, we will get back to you in the next hour and a half to two hours with the exact numbers that you requested. Got it. Uh, so I want to thank those who are uh, in, uh, in the public, uh, the young people, um, the organizations that testified today um, gave us great feedback on what's happening and what's not happening with the organization. I wanna thank you, Director, for your testimony. We look forward to figuring out how to uh, grow the, the agency to be more efficient, um, to be more diligent. Um, and to, you know, we always wanna look for improvement in our government agencies to take care of our, uh, the District of Columbia. So I wanna thank you. I just don't wanna know for the public that our public record um, if you still have not submitted testimonies, the testimonies are still open. Um, you can submit it uh, via email at ryA at dccouncil.us. Again, that's ryA at dccouncil.us. The time is now 2.15 p.m. And this budget oversight hearing is adjourned. Thank you. God bless. Thank you.